<clears throat> hey, there we are. Good morning, beloved. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us for Sunday Fellowship. <clears throat> I'm always doing something, <clears throat> when, and, and Jim slips it in there, and next thing you know, I'm, I'm on the screen looking at you, and you're looking at me doing dumb stuff. He plans it that way, don't you, brother? You plan it that way. And I'm, I, I can count the hairs on, the, on, the, on your ball spot, too. <laughs> well, beloved, we are going to conclude the documentary we've been doing the last six. This is week number six, which I have never done before. This, this is a new first. I love new first. If you don't like new first, you don't like change. If you don't like change, you're not going to grow spiritually, even emotionally. But anyway, week, uh, believe it or not, I was just telling Curtis. Curtis asked me before we got started, man, you're going to have a lot. One, two, three pages, and most of that is verses. So uh, we said pretty much everything we had to say, except for a few things we're going to discuss today on the last part of this passage that we've been reading in Hebrews 4 and 12. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to say some things after we get going here about uh, Hebrews that maybe some of you didn't know, and it's, it's, I think it's relevant to what we uh, uh, talk, have been talking about. I think it's relevant. I think it's important, but it's not critical to understand what the Spirit is saying if you don't know these things. But it is, uh, the Father gave me this last night, sorry, sometime yesterday when I was reviewing some of these things. And I was reading in this passage in Hebrews, and the Spirit pricked me about something about the writer. And I'll discuss that after we get started as we go down the, the line here uh, and conclude with the uh, uh, dividing of, 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 sp- of soul and spirit. Uh, now, Curtis, this is not going to be a snatch your head from your shoulders type message. Okay, brother, so you can rest. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. This is, this is a conclusion uh, I'm not going to go over everything that we've talked about in the past, just maybe mention a couple of things that we've talked about. If you want to, you can go back and review <laughs> all five weeks of, uh, of uh, this, this particular documentary. So with that said, my dear wife is going to be reading for us. Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This week, we will conclude with our documentary, The Dividing of Soul and Spirit. In the last weeks, we looked at God creating man as a tripartite being of soul, of spirit, soul, and body. We have covered the importance of each part of man's makeup. There's quite a lot to learn concerning the three parts of tripartite man. There are things we've learned about the Trinity, which many of you may not have known before this documentary. It is even more clear today why Paul calls these things a mystery which are hidden in Christ. There are yet many more things to be revealed concerning our spiritual identity and mystery of sonship. As we review our intro verse, we see everything we've discussed in these parts in these past several weeks hinges on one specific thing, the Word of God. Reading Hebrews 4.12 appears to have nothing to do with any of the verses before it or after it. In this verse, it seems that the writer just dropped those words in the middle of his dialogue as a distractor. It just doesn't seem to fit what he's talking about. As I have a tendency to say sometimes when listening to people talk, where'd that come from? So let's see what the Spirit is saying. The verse starts out by saying, for the word of God. The writer is putting the word of God in focus as the beginning to confirm who has been speaking to the people of God for centuries, as well as now. As you can see, I didn't use the word is yet. We'll talk about that in a few. Most of us know the word of God is not the Bible. It is not paper and ink on the paper. The Apostle John tells us in his gospel that the Word is a person. John 1, 1 through 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That's good. That's good. 
uh, as Catherine reading those things to you, part of the notes, uh, I just want to remind you of something. Talk, we've talked to you guys in the past, those of you who have been with us for a while, you, you know this, those of you who haven't, uh, maybe it be uh, something new to you. Uh, we talk about the Bible, uh, people talk about the Bible in terms of uh, academics and, in, and, 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 and intellect. And I just want to mention something about ac- academics and intellect. Remember, the, everything in the Bible is spiritual. Let me say it again. In case I speak it in tongues, let me, let me interpret that for you. Everything in the Bible is spiritual. No matter where it is, where it comes from, what's being said. There is, because it's inspired by God, even sometimes the things that are evident that maybe Paul or John or Peter is talking about, that's happening at that time. But no matter what you see biblically, let me say it again, no matter what you see biblically, everything there is spiritual. With that said, let me point out some factors about Hebrews that many, uh, some of you might not know. Uh, there's some brethren, there's brothers and sisters I know that will, will tell you that Paul wrote Hebrews. That's not true. It, it's just, it can't, right now it can't be proven. There's some that argue and say he, he, he did, some that say he doesn't, but, but there's not a lot of documentation to say Paul wrote Hebrews. Now, when I was approached by this many years ago, the answer that the Father gave me to give them said it doesn't really make a difference. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So you making the scribe the issue and not the initiator of, the, of what's being said. That's a religious thing. So I wanted to say that, one, that we technically, uh, it's, it, it, some scholars believe that Apollos or Barnabas uh, wrote the, 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 the book of Hebrews. Or Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. It doesn't really matter. The Holy Spirit inspired it because it's spirit. It, everything in the Bible is spiritual. So I want to say that. So the second thing I want to say about that is the writer of Hebrews, <laughs> let me back up. Hebrews is to Israel. The book of Hebrews is to Israel. It is not to the whole church. It is to, it is to, it is to Israel. It's to the Jews. Let me say that again. There's a lot of believers that all go over Hebrews. Hebrews is written by a Hebrew, someone who knew and understood uh, the history of the Hebrew people and the law and the promise of the Messiah. They, they knew all of this. So he's not writing to everybody. Uh, and he, and he, he we'll, we'll cover that a little bit this morning as, as we conclude about the word of God. Uh, that the writer here is, is making a, a, a statement and a plea to a specific group of people, and it's not the church. He's making a plea to a specific group of people, uh, which, is, which is Israel, which is the Hebrew people, which technically this book goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Now, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'm saying it now. The Hebrew people began, that race of people began in Hebrews chapter, I mean, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, <clears throat> when God had not a man to till the ground. Well, that's 2 6, I mean, 2 5. But uh, 2 7 is where the Hebrew people got started. That's where it got started. So now we're reading about everything from that moment forward up until this point. And so the writer of Hebrews is making a specific point to a group of people about God, about the Word of God. And we're going to look at that in just a second. Because at first glance, it appears, I was talking to Curtis about this last week when we were talking about this, we were talking about, I made the comment that it looks like the writer of Hebrews just took 412 and dropped it in the middle of 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 of, of this chapter. I mean, just... Boom, dropped it in there and said, okay, here it is. Do what you want with it. And, he, and Curtis said to me, he said, yeah, you know, I looked at that. And you, you just, I don't see how it fits anything. And so I went to our father. I said, you know, father, this, I don't see how this fits. You got to show me how this fits into what we've been talking about. What makes 412 relevant to everything else in this chapter? Maybe even, so he said, go back and read chapter 4. I went back to the beginning, read chapter 4. Then he said, go back and read chapter 3. He said, you'll see it. When you see it, you'll know it. So I did. I went back and I read chapter 3. And then I said, you know what? Let me go back to chapter 2. So I went back to chapter 2 and I said, well, let me look at chapter 1. 
and all of a sudden the Spirit opened my eyes to see something. 412 fits, but you can't start with 412, dividing asunder between soul and spirit, and, and figure out what's being said because it says the Word of God. He starts with the Word of God. Now, the word is, it, well, that verse says, in, in, at least in King James, I think in, 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 in a couple of the others, it says, for the Word of God is. Well, that defines something for us. That tells us something about what the writer is writing. But it also tells us something about the writer's thinking. Now, the writer is Hebrew. So there are some words in this, which I did not know before I did the word search on some of these words. There are some words in this verse, in 412, that even though it's written in Greek, the writer is Hebrew and his thoughts are back in the Old Testament. And so there are some words that he used that are Greek, but it has the roots in the Old Testament, which I did not realize until recently. So there's a lot more to this verse and to this chapter than meets the eye of just dividing us under between soul and spirit. Now, I'm going to tell you up front, and we'll get to that in a second, as we review this. This verse deals with identity. This verse deals with salvation, the exchange of identity. But the, the, the writer is not thinking that way. He's thinking from the past. He's thinking as a Hebrew. He's thinking as an Israelite. He's thinking as someone who has something God promised to a specific people who was not ready to receive what God was saying to them. So there's some things in this, in this verse or in this chapter, in, in chapters 1 through 5 specifically, uh, that make 412 realizable. Okay? So let's, let's look at this for a minute. Catherine, will you read some more of that for me, please? Um. <clears throat> Just going to read the last of, the, of that scripture. Mm -hmm. The same was in the beginning with God. And this person is God himself. The word and God are one. So the writer of Hebrews is confirming the truth of everything written to 412 is a person. He tells us the word is quick, alive or living, and powerful or active. He also tells us that the word of God is the only one that can keenly and specifically divide the old identity of body and soul, and the new identity of spirit. Notice it says... Now, hang on. Let me, let me, let me, let me qualify the, the, the why I said that. You, you didn't have an insert there, Jim. Thank you, brother. Let, let me qualify this. I said the, the writer is telling us that the Word of God is the, is the only one that can keenly and specifically divide. Now, when the writer says... The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder between souls. He is giving you a picture. He is not saying, he's not talking about necessarily a real sword. Now, some people, believe it or not, some people think that. But he's telling us this, that the word of God, this person has something sharper, is, is greater than the instrument that a human being can use. It's greater than anything that can be used to divide something. And so he's saying this is more powerful. This is uniquely or keenly specifically able to do something that nothing else is able to do, and it is able to divide your identity and your body-soul identity and the identity of spirit. Okay? Thank you, Jim. Notice it says, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We'll take a closer look at these words a little later. Let's keep in mind who is being spoken to in this book, the Hebrew people, who became the nation of Israel and expressed their identity as the Jews. His thoughts and words started in chapter 1, verse 1. He says, God, the word of God, did something. He spoke to them in the past. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in, in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. But the power of verse 2 gives the word of God a new identity for them. Hebrews 1.2 Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. The word of God is the son of God. 
What else does the writer say about the Son? A quick review of several verses in the book of Hebrews will help us see clearer his intent in 4.12. Hebrews 1.5, <clears throat> For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Hebrews the, the power in that verse is just incredible. It, 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 I won't discuss it. I, re- I really won't because it'll, it'll, it'll take a little bit more time. But the power in that verse is just incredible. At which of the angels at any time he said, uh, at any time, thou art my son. Now, I want you to think about that for a second because we know in uh, uh, Isaiah 12, Lucifer is called the son of the morning. Uh, in Job, the angels are called sons of God. They are. They are adopted. They're not, cre- they're not birthed by him. They're created beings that God has given the position of identity as the son by adoption, just like Genesis 2, uh, Genesis 2 7 with Adam, with, uh, with the man he created, uh, he, he, he uh, formed uh, and adopted him and put him in a place in his uh, place that he can learn who, uh, learn who he is to him as a son. But I want to touch, because he, at, at any time, thou art my son. That has to do with birth. That has to do with something more than adoption, something more than taking on an identity. Because adoption, you take on that. But uh, let, we'll get to that in a second. Keep, keep going, please, honey. I'm sorry. Hebrews 1.8, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Hebrews 3.6, But Christ as a Son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope Firm unto the end. Hebrews 4.14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our, prof- our profession. Hebrews 5.5, 5, so also Christ glorified not only, uh, Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Hebrews 5.8, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered. Hebrews 7.28, for the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity, but the, word of the, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son, who is consecrated forevermore. Well, that's a powerful verse, too. I wish we had time to go over that. That's, that verse is just the word of the oath. We could, we could go on in that one. That is, which was since the law. So it had something since the law. Uh, and and that, that word of the oath makes the son who is consecrated forever. That's, that's uh, really that has to do with our birth. That has to do with our spiritual birth since the law. But okay. And the, and the law ended at where? Cross. The cross. The law ended at the cross. That God's not... God's not making any more, any more adopted children by the law. They all came by the law, but now it's by birth, spiritual birth. We're in the dispensation of sonship because we're in a dispensation or a time arranged by God. That's the word dispensation means arrangement. The time arranged by God where he takes a human being who wants to receive and believe in him through his son, they are spiritually birthed. That is the only time in history, this is the only time in history that this dispensation is active. Once the, the, once the body is removed from the earth, there will be no more spiritual birth. We go back to the, the adoption process or the saving of souls, which is another, we talked about that in the past, uh, but we won't go into that right now. So keep going, please. Thank you. As we read in chapter 2, the word of God is being spoken of again. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels... That word is the word of God. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect 
so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that had heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and events of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Now, just I want to I want to draw your attention. I want to mark that if you can, <clears throat> this word miracles and gifts. I want you to mark that in your thoughts or if you're using your Bible Mark that word gifts because that has something to do with, with where we're going here with uh, joints and marrows, thoughts and intents. That word gifts is one of those words in the Greek. Go ahead. The word of God was always alive and active or powerful, even to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those before the last days, according to the writer. Now, Think about what he's saying. He's saying that the word of God was active, alive, living. And it went all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Matter of fact, we could have put, I could have put Adam on here, which would have probably been more appropriate, would have, would have added Adam, because out of Adam came Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I didn't put it on there because I didn't think about it at the time, because every, we all think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the, the writer of Hebrews is probably... I would say is on that on that path of thinking too, because he's going to quote some of these things as we move on. So let's move on, please. Soul and spirit, Hebrews four, two through three, six eleven. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said. As I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter here therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. All right, let me, let me have some time with this. All right. I, <laughs> this is where uh, this is where he makes what appears to be a jump. Now, verse eleven says, uh, as Catherine just read, "Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest." The rest he talked about, the rest that God, the Word of God, said He would give them, uh, lest any man fall after the same example of, of unbelief. Well, he's talking about that which happened in the wilderness. We're still talking about Israel. We're still talking about a people. We're still talking about someone the writer is writing to that understands what's being said about what happened in the past. But he jumps off of verse 11, and he goes right into verse 12 and said, the word of God is quick, a living, powerful, active, a sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder, between soul and spirit, what? He's already laid that out for, the, for them. Their minds are tracking with him in his understanding of where they came from as a people. Those in the past who had soul salvation and those who are currently faced with spirit salvation or identity. So uh, I wanted to put these verses in that to... to, to because all of chapter 3 is powerful, but I didn't want to write, put all of those verses in this because it, it would just take us forever and a day to, uh, to get that, uh, all of this, these verses in line to, to show you where the Spirit was leading the, the writer of Hebrews, whether it was Apollos, whether it was Paul, whether it was Barnabas, or some of the other writers, uh, some of the other those leaders back in the day. But they had something specific to say to the people of Israel to the Hebrew people concerning the Word of God and what effect that it had on them today. Remember, he's no longer speaking to us by, our, by the prophets as he spoke to our fathers. He's speaking to us by his son. So he's telling the, the people who are reading this, the, the Israelites or the Hebrew people who read, God's speaking to us today by the son, the Word of God. So let's, let's, let's go down to the next one, please. I wanted to give a few definitions. <clears throat> uh, uh, I put and only this the only one this the only the only uh, Greek word I use only because 
if you can read this, I'm going to pronounce it for you, is Hamas. Now, how many of you <laughs> you hear today about Hamas in Israel? They are, they are the Palestinians. There's a, there's a, a group called Hamas, an Islamic group called Hamas, and they're fighting against Israel. I was amazed to look when I read, when I looked at this, and they gave the definition of the word Hamas uh, to artic- joint, to articulate, uh, well, an articulation of the body, a joining, a joint, and the root word means to join, to fit, or to fit together. The word means union. The word joint <coughs> in this text means union. Because if you think about it, (coughs) where is a joint? Between two bones. The the, the tibia, which is a shin bone, and the the femur, which is the thigh bone, meet and come together where? At the knee, which is the joint. (coughs) It provides union. So uh, also I wrote, uh, there's one reference in, in the root word in Joel. That's when, I, that's when the, the Spirit kind of pricked me to, to see something. He used a word that has a meaning in the Old Testament in Joel. It's only one, one place it's used. It's in Joel 2, 2 verse 5. Joel chapter 2, verse 5. <clears throat> but you got to remember, this writer is Hebrew. And so he's speaking from his knowledge of the law and the prophets. Joel is a prophet. He's speaking from his knowledge of the law and the prophets. So when we look, we, his, his, he's using Greek, but his mind and his identity is in the Old Testament from what God was saying to this people from the beginning. That's why the word of God separates the past from the present. It separates the outer from the inner. It separates uh, identity of the flesh to identity in the spirit. So let's, let's, let's go to the next one. Marrow. Enclosed within, to close, shut. Hebrew, uh, Job 21, 24, fat, fatling, fat one, rich, noble. Now, I, I was surprised, again, that there was a, the word, the, the marrow is only used one time, and it's in this, ver, it's in this particular verse in the Greek. But in the Hebrew... They had a reference, a Hebrew reference, and it was, it was uh, Job tw- 21, 24. And the word means fat or fatling. They said it means, <clears throat> you were talking about sheep. <clears throat> now, Jim has been to, to Ghana with me, <clears throat> and I know uh, David Griffin, if he was here, he would tell you guys this. Uh, when, we, when we go to Ghana, if you go to Ghana and you're from America, unless you're thin, they say you're fat. And over there, if you're fat, that means you, you are wealthy or rich. Right, Jim? It means you have money. And so I, I thought about this. And, and so in, 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 the, in the context of what's being said here in the word marrow in the Hebrew, it means noble or rich or fat. In the Greek, it means to be uh, enclosed within or to close or to shut. But the, the, the author is Hebrew. So is he telling us something about when he says marry, he's telling us something about being closed or shut up? Or is he talking about something being rich? Talking about something being fat or fatling? Is he, is, he, is, he, is he pulling that from his Hebrew roots? But he also knows there's only, that, the word marrow in this verse is the only one in the Greek. There is no other Greek word. So is his mind communicating something that's current, or is it bringing forth something from the past? Is he thinking about the marrow, the fat, the marrow, the rich, the noble, joints and marrow? Hmm. Let's go on. Discerner. The Greek means decisive, critical, relating to judging, fit for judging, skilled in judging, one who passes or arrogates to himself judgment on anything, an arbiter. James 2, 3 through 4, And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit you here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, and sit here under my footstool. And ye are 
then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts. Now, I left the, 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 the word uh, uh, I left the word uh, judges in there. But there's the same Greek word. You can, repl- you can run a line through the word judges and put discerner. You are you become a discerner of evil thoughts. In other words, your thinking. Have you discerned your thinking that you take people who have money when they come in the church, they sit down and you take the ones who got on nice clothes and you set them, you set them in the good seats and you take those who are poor and you stand them up in the corner and say, hey, y'all go stand up. Let these people who go, who, who, who go, who going to live, who going to bring money and give us some money here. There's some fellowships I know that do that. They have a place specifically down front for the people who give big money and everybody else. And they have it roped off and you can't get to it. Pro, pro football players, pro basketball players, they got a little place for them up front. We keep them up front. And nobody going to sit in unless you're giving that kind of money. Tell you the truth. <laughs> it's, it's there. So, but he's saying there. Because you do those things, you can't discern those are evil thoughts. Anyway, continue. Thoughts and intent. Thoughts in the Greek, a thinking, consideration, deliberation, device, root, to bring to mind, revolve in mind, ponder, to think, to deliberate. Matthew twelve twenty five, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Acts 17.29, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. That word device is what? thoughts. Mm. Graven art by man's thoughts. thoughts. Remember, discerner of the thoughts. So he's calling thoughts in this verse devices. We could have, the Hebrew, uh, the writer of Hebrews used that Greek word. Could have been saying God, he, he's the discerner of the devices and the intents of the heart. But he used the word thoughts. It's the same word, devices of men, the thoughts of men. Now, go back up to the, to the definition, please, for me a minute, Dad. Jim. No, up or the other way. I should say down, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to point out one thing here. That's good. I just wanted to point out one thing here. We're talking about something that's going on in the soul mind. Now, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I was telling you about thoughts and the impulses. Now, this has to do with something I think we talked about uh, Friday in our a Zoom lunch. <clears throat> and I'm going to repeat it today for some clarity on, on what, I'm, what I'm saying here. Beloved, in Genesis chapter 2, man had original thought. That's why we see there's several things happening in, in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, but God is bringing the animals before Adam to see what he would call them. And uh, we see that the, the, that passage tells us that whatever Adam named the, the, the animals, that's the name that they were. God was not standing around the corner whispering into his ear saying cow or jackass or hippopotamus. He, he didn't do that. He said whatever he called it, he, he gave them, as Curtis said when we were talking the other day, he gave them identity. God gave the choice, the man made a decision of identity. God gives choices. We don't. We make decisions of identity with those choices. So I wanted to put that in there because in Genesis chapter 3, <clears throat> well, we, we discussed this the other day in, in, in Zoom lunch. I'm going to Kind of repeat it for you guys because, of course, you didn't hear it. But we see in, in the garden, in, in, in chapter 2, God makes Adam a help meet, makes him a woman. And Adam, again, original thought, said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So he has 
identified this female. That you are, this is a female. Thou shalt be called woman. He has already made the decision of identity as his. Thou art bone of my bone. Flesh. In other words, you came from me. You are part of me. The issue with that is, at, th- at that time, they were of the same mind. His flesh and his body was of the same mind. They thought the same. Because it says, a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they of twain. Man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife. Union. And they of twain shall be one flesh. This, we, we, we won't discuss that again. When we get to chapter 3, we, we see the serpent's not talking to the man. He's talking to his flesh. So that tells you your flesh, now I'm going to say this, and don't, don't, don't take me too literally on this, but your flesh has a mind of its own. What do I mean a mind of its own? It means it, it, what's happening in your body, because the body houses the soul, as we talked about in week two, or week three, the body houses a complete soul. So that means for every aspect of the human body, there's an impulse. There's a, a what I call, uh, uh, I think I said impulse is the word I used a few weeks ago. Every impulse in the body f- has its way inside to the soul mind. So what you're feeling, whatever senses you're using in the flesh, whether it's hearing, seeing, tasting, touching, smelling, all has the same parallels in the soul. You can hear, you can see uh, with that. So all I'm saying is that that the the thoughts that we have today come from impulses from outside. They're impulses. We don't have original thought. We, We can't run the world based on what we do now because we have all been identified. We become the flesh person we have been. Body and soul for us are one, and we think that way. So all of our impulses come from somewhere else. No human being, I'm not going to make this dogmatic, so those of you who have trouble with this, that's fine. I, 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 I can go with you, okay? I'm not going to be dogmatic on this, but I'm going to say to you, you and I, no human being, born again or not, saved or unsaved, have original thought. We have impulses that we receive from either the enemy or the Spirit of God through the flesh, and we will get to that in a second when it comes to intent, we will process it. But you don't have original thoughts. No one has original thought anymore. So you're always receiving impulses. Now, because, (laughs) because the soul has senses, as we talked about in, in, in Hebrews chapter, chapter 5. Your soul, you have senses. You can pick up those things. You hear certain things with your voice. Maybe, maybe sometimes you're doing something, you hear my voice. That's a, that's a tough one. I remember some years ago, our dear sister, uh, Malinda, uh, Chris's wife, Malinda, uh, made a statement to me years ago. We, Catherine and I was training at 24-Hour Fitness before we started training from home, and we were doing lunges, and I had an easy curl ball with some, with some pretty good weight on I was doing lunges, and man, my body started to hit me, and I heard my Linda's voice say, you're not going to stop now, are you? <laughs> was that her? No, it wasn't her. But the thought attached it to a voice that I knew, and it said something to me. I knew that wasn't her. I told her. I told her, and she laughed. That's how it was impulses. We receive impulses, guys. There's no original thoughts. Now, if you can find something that will, that, that will correct that or you find something in the, that, that the Father gives you uh, 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 biblically that would like to show me that you have a re- we have original thought, go for it. I'll be glad to, do, I'll be glad to change that. But I, I, when he showed me we, have, we don't have original thought in the flesh anymore, now we can have revelation in the Spirit that's original to us spiritually by, by spiritual birth. But other than that, 
you get impulses. And you respond to those impulses. And the minute you take responsibility for that impulse, it's mine, it is yours, and you're accountable for it. So when we're talking about thoughts and intents of the heart, thoughts come from outside, and you receive that impulse, and it becomes a thought to you or a way of thinking, as this definition says, and you process it. And you take most of us, if you don't know any better, you take possession of it, and it becomes yours. Then you become accountable for it. That's why you don't have to say anything sometimes to, 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 uh, 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 to do something that you shouldn't do. You, don't have, you can think it. What do you mean? You, you can think somebody. You can think something about somebody. And the Holy Spirit might tell you, say, you know, that's not, that's, not, that's not the way you should think. He's not telling you. He's telling you that's not a thought you need to receive. That's not a thought you need to receive. So you can say, I don't receive that as my thought. I don't think that way about that person or whatever. I'm just using an example. I'm just trying to show you when he talks about a discerner of the thoughts. Thoughts come from impulses. Impulses gives, uh, as you receive the impulse, it becomes something that you are thinking about from a picture or, or imagination, whatever it is you have going on in your in your. Um, in, in, in your uh, soul, mind, or your heart, because that's where this is going, uh, you, then you become accountable for those things. So he's saying there's a discerner, someone who judges those things, but we'll get to that in a second. As we looked at the word discerner, uh, uh, someone who, who, uh, who uh, relating to judging to fit, uh, let's see, um, an arbitrator. Someone who is an arbitrator. The word of God is an arbitrator, which means you don't have to. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Is an arbitrator. Arbiter. Someone who re- helps you realize. Someone who weighs things for you. So believe me, every thought that comes to your mind is not yours. N- none of it's yours. I know that's hard to grab, but the, and if you can't wrap your mind around it, pray about it. But none of these things come to you. We have been so long living in the flesh till every thought that comes to our mind becomes ours, and then you feel bad, and the devil gets you all down and beats you up. If you're the son of God, why are you thinking that way? Oh, Father, Lord, forgive me. I didn't, I didn't really mean. Don't buy into it. Don't buy into it. And if you do, you, uh, for instance, you, 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 uh, <laughs> bone daddies, ask Curtis. Ask Curtis. He can tell you. Don't buy into it. <laughs> I won't go into detail. But don't buy it. It's not yours. But the minute you own it, you're accountable for it. That's what that means by a discerner of the thoughts. And let's go to the next one. Intense. Let's go to the next uh, definition, Catherine. You didn't read intent. No, it's not. Oh, you didn't. Intent, Greek, the act of thinking, consideration, meditation, a thought, notion, conception, mind, understanding, will, manner of feeling and thinking, moral understanding, root, the mind comprising alike, The faculties of perceiving and understanding of those of feeling, judging, determining, reason in the narrower sense, as the capacity for spiritual truth, the higher powers of the soul, the faculty of perceiving divine things, of recognizing goodness, and of hating evil. So, the intent is the is the is the means by which that thought has purpose. It's the reasoning part. It's the conception. It is the narrow sense and understanding of those. Now, remember, it says the word of God is the discerner. It will tell you. He will say to you, that's not the Father. But you should come to a place where you hear stuff, you hear stuff going into you, going, running through your soul, mind, and you say, well, Father, I know that didn't come from you. 
You father, I'm, I, I'm under attack by this, by, 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 by the devil or Lucifer. I call him that boy. <laughs> I say, Father, you need to, I, 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 that's how I talk to him. I say, Father, you need to do something with your boy. You created him. You need to do something with him. And sometimes he'll say to me, speak to him. Sometimes he'll say to me, uh, loose. You got life in you, loose it on him. But I do not handle anything from the devil. I do not rebuke him until, unless I hear rebuke. I do not acknowledge him. I, want, I will not acknowledge those thoughts. I go right to my father. I say, Father, I know they didn't come from you. I know where it came from. I, I'm, now, I'm telling you where I am as the son of God. I, I, I don't know where you are, but I'm telling you, the discerner is not you trying to figure out where it came from. The discerner in you should know that it's not the father. The difference. And it might take you a minute to learn that. It might take you a minute to learn that. It took me a minute to learn that. Maybe, in my case, five minutes. I'm a little slow sometimes. But that's what this is saying. The word of God is the discerner between the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay. So, I hate to break it to you, but that's it. Maybe it, maybe it didn't drop the way you thought it was going to drop. But we've been five weeks. This is six weeks on this. And I didn't. There was several. Other, that's another way. I, I was praying about this this past week. And I could have added some more to this. I could have. have some, there's some words, some definitions, some things we could have said. But I want to close by saying this. or come into the conclusion by saying we've learned some things this last five weeks. Uh, week six, if you want to count this week. We've learned some things. We learned some things about identity. That it is the word of God. It is this person. This person that divides for us who we are versus who we were. There's this person that, 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 that is our discerner. He discerns. And because of who we are spiritually... Our discerner is working all the time. The problem is we've not, we've not allowed him to be the discerner. You have a thought sometimes, and you'll go off on that right away. Fear drives what, let me, ooh, thank you, Father. Most of our thoughts, most of your thoughts, most of your thoughts are fear-driven. The impulse of fear drives your thinking. The impulse of your fears drives your thinking, and it always, let me say it, you can shoot me an email, I don't, I don't mind, you can shoot me a text message, I don't mind, but it'll always hinge in your past, 99, because that's all he has. All Satan has to attack you is in your flesh. Your worst enemy is your flesh because your flesh has been used so long, your impulse has come from your past identity. It comes from your past identity. So, we don't have to live that way. The writer of Hebrews, uh, once again, the whole book of Hebrews really is not necessarily to the church, the body of Christ. A lot of them take it that way. There's some things in Hebrews uh, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, excellent verses. There's some, there's some universal verses in that particular chapter that are universal to everyone. Uh, but most of this book of Hebrews is not written to the body of Christ as a whole. It's written to a people who knew about what God did in the wilderness, who understood what God was saying to them by the prophets, to our fathers. That, that, well, that's not me. That's not most of you. But again, the process, the, the mystery of sonship would allow us to embrace the idea that everything in Hebrews is not necessarily for us, uh, to us, I'm sorry. It's all for us, 
but it's not necessarily to us. So with that said, I won't, I won't belabor this anymore. I won't try to stretch it out, make any more. I want to thank you if you've been with us uh, for these last, this week is six weeks. I have not taught on one thing in six weeks. In, now, I've taught six, I've taught months and months and months <laughs> before, uh, but not anything like this, not like this documentary we've set before you, the Father said before me. I've given you what he'd given me. Uh, if it, if it ministered to you, amen. If it does minister to you, amen. Because uh, uh, like I said last week, I'm not here to entertain you. But with that said, I've enjoyed this last five, six weeks. Uh, we said some things that f- it was just amazing. Father showed us some amazing things. So I trust that if you want to go back and listen to some of it, uh, I, I do uh, I didn't listen to the one last week. I listened to the one the week before. I l- go back and listen to it periodically just to help me hear again what was being said. Because even though I'm teaching it, even though he's given it to me, even though it came, when I'm listening to it coming to me, there's something about it. I hear something in it that I didn't see before. So with that said, we trust to see you guys next week. Uh, brother, brother Dwight Davis will be with us next Sunday, and he's going to talk about something the Father gave him for you as a body. So, guys, I I appreciate you, and I trust the Father to see you next week. Amen.